such an honor and a pleasure to be with you. I've never been to Fort Wayne before, and uh, we had a lovely afternoon. How many of you were with us this afternoon? Um, just a great opportunity to get a panorama of some of the different progressive actions uh, the groups that are here, and uh, I understand that this is a, a little island of blue in a sea of red. Is that the video here? <laughs> so I know it's your hope to spread the blue. Uh, it is a lovely color. I could pink, but blue is very nice. Uh, and um, I, I also am just already so uh, admiring of the center and the uh, way that you, Michael, and your uh, colleagues have been able to uh, take people to the Middle East. How many of you have gone on trips with the center? Wow, that is incredible. They all tend to sit right there. So. <laughs> <laughs> they travel in packs. Uh, it is wonderful. I mean, what a way to get people to care about these issues because that's our number one problem is how do we get people to care? And especially when you're talking about such a tricky issue as Israel-Palestine. Boy, that is the hardest issue for folks to talk about. I don't know if I'm allowed to say it, Sam, that this was uh, one of the issues that might have kept some people away today in that um, both the center and my organization, Code Pink, are supporters of people's right to use their uh, dollars the way they would like to. And if they want to support a boycott, sanctions, divest campaign, that should certainly be their right in this country. And because we are supporting that, there were some groups that didn't want to join us. It is kind of amazing to me still that that is an issue. I can understand people who don't want to be part of a BDS campaign. That is certainly their right. But not to recognize our right to do it and to try to make it illegal uh, is something that I find deeply disturbing. And that's why it's so important that your organization is taking ordinary middle America people to the Middle East. Um, my group, Code Pink, is one of the six groups that has been banned by Israel uh, because of our work around boycott, divestment, sanctions. And uh, I also, uh, we think it's important that we be pushing our Congress people to visit Israel and Palestine, but not with a lobby group. Right. Now, you know, there is the biggest foreign policy lobby group in the United States is? AIPAC. 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 Right. <laughs> And APAC certainly should have the right to exist in this country. I happen to think they should have to register as a foreign agent. But um, they should not have the right to take our Congress people to Israel. Because there is a law that says that lobby groups cannot provide free trips to elected officials for a very good reason, because you don't want those elected officials to be beholden to a lobby group. Right. Well, APAC does it in a very spectacular way, which is they put tremendous pressure on every single new member of Congress, basically demanding that they travel with them to Israel. I have friends who were elected to Congress, they said they never experienced that kind of pressure. Of course, they get the pressure when they're running for office as well. They get visited quite a lot. And you know, some people say that APAC, it's all about the money. You know, it's not. They are good organizers. And we have to give them credit for that. They have groups in every single congressional district and they make sure that their members have a relationship with their congressional representatives, that they go and visit them when they are campaigning, they visit them immediately after they are elected, and they continue to visit them. And their uh, APAC gatherings in Washington, D.C. are enormous, absolutely as enormous. Right, Sam, Amara, those of you have been to, uh, with us when we protest them, they get many, many thousands of people. But the fact that they demand that US Congress people travel with them uh, 
it, in what should be violation of the law is something we should be concerned about. Because when I asked how many of you went, you, a lot of you raised your hand, and you know that traveling to that part of the world, you can see one reality or you can see another one, depending on who takes you, where you go, who you talk to. And when APAC goes, it is a very scripted trip. They see what the Israeli government wants them to see. They hear what the Israeli government wants them to hear. And um, we have been complaining about that, my organization Code Pink, for many years. And in fact, we've uh, registered formal complaints with the Ethics Committee. We did it again this year. And uh, if you look at the uh, filings that APAC has online, you will see that it is the exact same address as the non-lobby educational group that is set up as a front group to organize these trips. That's the American Israel Education Fund. And that group has the same address as APAC, has the same, well, overlapping board as APAC, um, has the same staff as APAC does. And in fact, when you look at the amount of money that this educational groups, uh, uh, the amount of staff that they have to organize these trips, they have no paid staff. All of the staff comes from the lobby group, APAC. You would think that would be illegal. It's a shell game. but. Um, it is very hard in our Congress to get some uh, traction around our ethics complaint. And we have found that while we on the outside can lodge a complaint, those complaints don't go anywhere. But if you had one member of Congress that lodged a complaint, that would have to trigger an investigation. So we put out an alert recently asking if there was one brave person in Congress that would lodge that campaign complaint. And it can't be uh, Ilhan Omar, it can't be Rashida Tlaib, it can't be the people who have been so maligned, so attacked already, and accused of being anti-Semites. It has to be somebody who can kind of, you know, hold that down uh, and so we are looking, if you know anybody, if you have any relationships with Congress people, because they really, they should not be allowed to do that. And that would change things significantly if Congress people were not obligated to go on these APAC trips. Um, they would maybe go with other organizations. You know, there's Jewish Voice for Peace, um, does wonderful trips. J Street does very good trips to the Middle East. Uh, there are Muslim groups that do them as well. So we're not saying don't go. We're saying go with groups that will really show you a uh, variety of perspectives and give you a much better understanding of why this is such an intractable problem. Now, when I was asked to talk about peace building in the age of Trump, uh, I think there, it's important to first talk about a couple of issues that I think progressives get wrong. And that is that while many of the issues we care about have gotten worse under the Trump administration, there are some attempts that the Trump administration, and particularly Donald Trump, has made um, that we should actually be hopeful about and supportive of. And those are two attempts to solve long-standing wars. One of them is Afghanistan, and the other is uh, Korea. In the case of Afghanistan, yes, it was a very botched idea to bring the Taliban to Camp David two days before the 9-11 attacks. But it's not a bad idea to be talking to the Taliban. In fact, it is very important to be talking to the Taliban. Most of the people in the United States want these wars to end. And the only way they're going to end is through negotiations. So it actually is a good thing that the Trump administration has been talking to the Taliban. 
you know, the, the, the idea, we don't know a lot about the, the specifics of that negotiation, but we do know that there are 14,000 troops in Afghanistan right now, and that the talks that they have been carrying out would reduce um, the uh, U.S. troops by 5,400. And then the remaining number would be conditioned on whether the Taliban were living up to the negotiations in terms of not letting Afghanistan be a haven for groups that might want to attack us, and that they were continuing to have negotiations with the Afghan government. According to the Taliban, and look, I'm a feminist. I'm a Jewish feminist, secular person. I have no love for the Taliban. <laughs> but what they are fighting for is they are fighting against a foreign occupation. And we are the foreign occupiers. They are also fighting against a government that they perceive to be put in place by a foreign occupier. The uh, Taliban will not stop fighting as long as the US troops are there. So indeed, if you're part of the military industrial complex and you want an endless war, there it is. Just keep the US troops there and the Taliban will keep fighting. What we do not see on our TV screens is what is the US doing? You know, these uh, negotiations were quashed when a US service person was killed in one of the recent attacks. And Mike Pompeo got up and said, you know, we are uh, stopping the negotiations, we're not bringing the Taliban here, but he said, we are attacking the Taliban very hard. And he bragged with the, within the previous 10 days, did you hear this, some of you heard this? Within the previous 10 days, the U.S. had killed a thousand members of the Taliban. I mean, it kind of, for those of us who are older, it recalls the uh, body counts in the Vietnam War days when you could not believe anything the government said. And certainly they must be exaggerating quite a lot. But even so, that is a lot of people that were killed in the previous 10 days. And it also, unbeknownst to the American public, the US is continually dropping bombs in Afghanistan. And just in the month of August alone, there were 810 U.S. airstrikes, according to the U.S. Department of Defense. 810 in one month alone. <laughs> and the U.S. is on track of having the same number, I think it was like 16,000 strikes last year. So a lot of people are getting killed. Now, I do not want any U.S. people to get killed. But here, Mike Pompeo was saying the equivalent of a thousand Talibs was one American. And who are the Taliban? They are mostly poor, very young men who have no other opportunities, are getting paid, and they're also being told that they are fighting the foreign aggressors. So there is what some people in the US military say, a constant reserve of young men to be recruited into the Taliban. So how long are we going to let this war keep going? How long are we going to be killing these young men in Afghanistan, creating more and more hatred towards us, spending the lives of our servicemen, and of course, our tax dollars? So the fact that the Trump administration wants to carry out one of the very few promises that many of us agree with is a good thing that should be supported. And I have a hard time with a lot of Democrats who are trashing Trump on this just because they want to go against anything that the Trump administration does. And the same thing is true for Korea. I was part of a group called Women Cross the DMZ that walked from North Korea into South Korea. And it was a tremendous, amazing experience where we were just hugging and crying, the women in North Korea, the women in South Korea, and it was just a beautiful, beautiful experience. Well, this is a war that has not been ended since 1953. This is a war that people on the Korean Peninsula are begging to see ended. And this is the war that the United States is part of because we have never signed a peace treaty with North Korea. 
We have U.S. bases all over South Korea, in fact, 37 of them. We have thousands and thousands of U.S. troops in South Korea, and we do constant, quote, war games with South Korea that are given names like uh, decapitation of the North Korean leadership. I mean, how would, again, I don't support Kim Jong-un or that government, but I certainly can, uh, can empathize with how they feel being surrounded by U.S. warships, U.S. war games, U.S. bases right next to them. And to have um, the first talks between Kim Jong-un and uh, Donald Trump was really historic. And I don't give that the credit to Donald Trump, I give the credit to the people of South Korea because they have been coming out and they had their own revolution to get rid of a corrupt leader in South Korea, put in a new leader uh, who had a mandate to make peace with North Korea. And at the height of the uprising in South Korea, they had one out of every three people in South Korea was out on the streets demanding an end to the corruption, demanding that they impeach their president, and demanding a peace process with the North. I think we have a lot to learn from South Korea. <laughs> um, so there is a process that has had its fits and starts, but it's a good process that has to be supported. And unfortunately, there too, we have Democrats that have put in the most ridiculous resolutions in Congress saying we will not allow the president to reduce the number of U.S. troops in South Korea. We will not allow the president to stop doing war games with, uh, in North Korea. I mean, this is not helpful. And so the main thing that I want to get across is that we have to love peace more than we dislike Donald Trump. As peace people, that is our obligation. And when there is some process that is good, we have to support the process no matter who is in charge of that process. That said, I think it is a time of great joy to celebrate the firing, or as somebody might say, <laughs> the resignation of John Bolton. So maybe we can do that. Uh, it is, uh, he was one of the most evil people we have ever had in the US government. And when um, he was fired, I was in the uh, Graver building, the halls of Congress in the cafeteria, and saw it come on the TV screens there on CNN, and I just couldn't believe it. And I jumped up on the table, and I started yelling and screaming like a wild woman, yay, let's hear a round of applause. John Bolton has been fired. And people said, yes, but you know, who will come after him? And I said, I don't know but I don't think it could be anybody as bad as John Bolton. And I think that's the truth. Maybe, you know, close to being as bad as John Bolton, but he was a particularly evil, evil man. And it's remarkable to think that he was once ambassador to the United Nations, because this is a guy that hates international bodies, that hates international law, that wants to bomb countries instead of using any kind of diplomacy. And this was the guy who had the ear of Donald Trump. Now, people were questioning, why did Donald Trump fire him? Why did they fire him? I think our questions should be, why did Donald Trump hire him? That is the question. Because Donald Trump, during his campaign, was saying, I'm going to stop these unnecessary, endless wars. Uh, I don't want to see the US being the policeman in the world, blah, blah, blah. And then he goes ahead and hires John Bolton, which is just quite inconceivable if you really want to have a policy that is winding down the wars uh, that we should never have been in in the first place. And so it's a very, very good sign that, Donald, uh, that, that John Bolton is no longer in that position. And you can tell by the mourning, uh, mourning meaning uh, sadness, that uh, it was seen from Netanyahu, for example, who very much liked Donald Trump. They were, uh, he was, uh, uh, John Bolton was extremely supportive of uh, the Israeli government. 
Of course, so is Jared Kushner and the U.S. ambassador there. Um, but John Bolton was encouraging of the horrendous moves that the Israeli government has been making, such as moving the U.S., uh, well, de declaring Jerusalem the capital of Israel, uh, having the U.S. capital be moved there. Uh, the Even the most recent uh, declaration now that is going to um, take control, Israeli control of the Jordan Valley um, is something that John Bolton had wanted. Uh, so it is good for um, any kind of movement towards peace that John Bolton is no longer there. But of course we know that these issues not only predated John Bolton, uh, they way predated Donald Trump. And the fact that the $3.8 billion a year that we are giving to the Israeli government Actually, we're giving most of it to U.S. weapons companies to then give to the Israeli government. Now, that was negotiated under the Obama administration. Um, but one of the uh, really pernicious effects of this even closer relationship that the Trump administration has had to Israel um, has been Israel pushing the United States to go to war with Iran. Um, this was the, the, the nuclear deal with Iran was President Obama's uh, signature foreign policy achievement. And Trump had said during his entire campaign, he was going to rip that up. Remember I'm talking about it was the worst deal ever. Came in, he ripped up the nuclear deal. And um, there was a very interesting piece that just came out in the New York Times talking about how Israel has been pushing and pushing and pushing for the United States to bomb Iran's nuclear research facility. I mean, this is particularly um, chutzpah on the part of Netanyahu, because if there's any country that has a secret nuclear program, we know which one that is, right? <laughs> It is Israel. Israel, a country that probably has about 200 nukes, but we don't know because they will never announce it, and the US doesn't pressure them to do that, has never joined the non-proliferation treaty, and the US doesn't pressure them to do that. But it is precisely Netanyahu who is constantly coming out, in fact, he just did it again a week ago, saying we have found new secret facilities that Iran has. Meanwhile, the agreement, uh, the nuclear agreement with Iran had the most harsh inspections uh, program ever imposed on any country in the world. And the International Atomic Agency that is the one in charge of doing those inspections has been saying, in fact, 13 times until recently, that Iran had complied with the treaty. In the meantime, not only does the Trump administration tear it up, but it imposes the harshest sanctions on Iran for complying with the treaty, basically. We have another group that COPIC is taking to Iran if we get our visas in time in another week. We have another one going in October because we think it is so important that people get to have the experience of a direct exchange with the Iranian people because they are uh, known worldwide for their hospitality. The nicest people that you could possibly meet. And Americans are just blown away when they go to Iran and say, I'm American, to see the kind of response they have. And as a Jew, I would always say, I'm a Jewish American, just to kind of see what the response was. And they would constantly be saying, we love Jews. We don't like the Israeli government. But we love Jews. We have the largest Jewish population in the Middle East outside of Israel. You can go into synagogues here in Iran. You can see we have a designated representative of the Jewish community in our government. And uh, yet, what only thing you hear from this Trump administration is the Iran being the greatest threat to not only the Middle East, but the greatest sponsor of terrorism in the world, is what they say. Now, I don't know what country you might put number one on that list. Who would you put as the number one state sponsor of terrorism? Saudi Arabia. 
So some people said Israel, some people said Saudi Arabia. I think I heard somebody say the United States. Yeah. <laughs> it would not be Iran. It certainly would not be Iran. And um, I talked about the Israelis pushing the US to bomb Iran, but there is also another country that has been pushing that, and that is Saudi Arabia. And they, both Israel and Saudi Arabia, have been pushing this narrative that Iran is the number one state sponsor of terrorism. Now, I wrote a book on Saudi Arabia. I did a lot of research on Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has this perversion of Islam called Wahhabism that it is spreading around the world. And it's kind of ironic because, you know, Mike Pompeo is a very, is an evangelist. And he thinks that the only real human right that the United States should care about is the right to freedom of religion. That's right. And so they've created new commissions and they have done uh, world gatherings of people to come and talk about the repression of the rights uh, of religion around the world. They talk about China. They talk about Iran repressing rights. They talk about Venezuela repressing religious rights. I don't, I don't quite get that one. They do not talk about Saudi Arabia. It is remarkable. They give whole speeches about the lack of, of religious freedom and don't mention that Saudi Arabia is the number one country in the world that does not allow freedom of religion. You know, it is illegal in Saudi Arabia to have a church, certainly never a synagogue. It is illegal to distribute Bibles. You, it is, uh, you can get the death penalty, which would be chopping off your head, if you converted from Islam. That is Saudi Arabia. And this is, of course, the greatest Arab ally that the United States has. And um, Saudi Arabia pushing the United States to go to war with Iran. I don't know if you saw the news today about the Saudis' oil facilities being attacked by drones. Well, this is a result of Saudi Arabia getting involved in a war it never should have been involved in, and that's next door in Yemen. In Yemen, where there was an internal dispute that Saudi Arabia had no right to get involved in, Saudi Arabia said Yemen was behind it. Yemen was not behind it. This was an internal dispute. And Saudi Arabia, just like George Bush back in the day when he said we could go and bomb uh, Iraq and get out of there in three months and it would be a piece of cake, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, the same one who is responsible for the murder of the Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi, thought the same thing, we can go into Yemen, get rid of those Houthis, and be done with it in a couple of weeks. That was March 2015. This is still going on today. The US has been selling the vast majority of the weapons that are used by the Saudis to cause the world's largest catastrophe in Yemen. That, is ever, that has resulted in, every 10 minutes, a child dying from the results of war. These bombs are being made in our country by companies that have entrenched themselves in our communities, including right here in Fort Wayne, like Raytheon, like BAE Systems. And of course, there's the big companies like Arthur Fromman and Boeing. Uh, they are making billions of dollars, literally, literally billions of dollars, selling these weapons to the Saudis, knowing full well that they're going to be used to kill civilians in Yemen. And you know, in the days of Vietnam, we used to see the results of our bombs. We used to see the, 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 the people being crushed, the uh, people burning, the houses burning, the villages burning. We don't see that in the case of Yemen. We don't see the 42 children killed on a school bus. We don't see the members of the wedding parties that are killed, of the funerals that are killed. We don't see any of that. And that's why it may, it's very hard to build up an anti-war movement these days because the American people don't see the results of the wars that we are either directly engaged in or indirectly engaged in. And so we continue to um, build up as, um, as best we can a movement trying to oppose US weapons sales to Saudi Arabia. 
Um, raise your hand if any of you have signed any petition, done anything to try to stop the US from selling weapons to Saudi Arabia. So a couple of you have. We have a sign-up sheet. Maybe we can pass it around, Michael, because I would love it if some of you would, uh, if all of you would sign up on the Code Pink site because we have only uh, actions once a week, but they're very important ones, like trying to stop the US participation in this war in Yemen. And I think that all of you in this room should participate in those actions because we have built up quite an amazing coalition of humanitarian aid groups like Oxfam, like Mercy Corps, the Red Cross, International Rescue Committee, the peace organizations, the human rights groups, and we are all working together. And it's been one of the things that we have been very successful on in that we have forced votes in the House and in the Senate. And you know the Senate is controlled by Republicans. We have won, won, like, yeah, yay, won, not won. Uh, um, we have won votes three times in Congress, including in the Senate, because of the spectacular work from the grassroots movements to say, we do not want to continue providing the weapons and logistical support for this brutal war in Yemen. Unfortunately, when those go to the desk of Donald Trump, they get vetoed. And in fact, he has used his veto power three times since he's been in office, twice was to veto bills that would stop the US support for the war in Yemen. And we are still working hard on this. We have it now in an in amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, and there are lots of very creative ways that we are finding to stop this. So I hope you join with us, and I hope this becomes part of, of what you will participate in, because we must, must, must end the brutal war in Yemen. We must end US support to the Saudis, including the weapon sales. And we have also at Code Pink, you know, I, I said that I'm from the Jewish community, and my relatives hate the work I do on Israel. And they say to me, why are you always picking on Israel? And why do you have this EDS campaign against Israel? And I realized that they were right. Why do we only, quote, pick on Israel? We should be picking on some of these brutal Arab countries. And so I did a lot of research and wrote this book on uh, Saudi Arabia uh, and started a campaign, a boycott campaign, on Saudi Arabia. And it's a fabulous campaign because little did we know when we started it, but there are lots and lots of opportunities to pressure groups to stop doing deals with Saudi Arabia. For one, there were over a dozen PR firms that were getting paid spectacular amounts of money by the Saudis, especially when Jamal Khashoggi was murdered. They needed all the PR help they could get. So they got more and more of these firms and paid more and more millions of dollars. And we started a campaign along with other groups like Amnesty International, uh, Human Rights Watch, uh, to start putting pressure on those PR firms saying, why are you representing this brutal regime? And we have had success in getting five of those firms to stop representing the Saudis. We have also put pressure on Ivy League universities that were getting millions of dollars naming things like their law schools after the Saudis, which have no rule of law to speak of. Uh, and um, we are putting pressure on the, quote, think tanks in Washington, D.C. that were getting millions of dollars from the Saudis for many years without anybody questioning them. And now they have to really uh, try to justify or stop taking money from the Saudis. The Crown Prince has been trying very hard to say that he is a reformer. And you might think, is there anything you think of that he has reformed? Well, right, let women drive. So when he, quote, let women drive, we have to know that there were campaigns for decades by women and their male uh, colleagues to be able to drive. And what the Crown Prince did was when he said, yes, we will allow women to drive, he took the very women who were the heads of those campaigns and he threw them in prison. And to this day, they're either in prison, having been tortured, 
or they're out of prison awaiting trial because of their work to give women the right to drive and also to end the entire guardianship system that treats women like a minor from the day they're born to the day they're die they die. So the crown prince took credit for opening up uh, and uh, easing some of the restrictions on women um, instead of giving credit to the women who fought so hard. But you have to think of, of what message he was sending to women and their allies all over Saudi Arabia, which was, I, the crown prince, will tell you what you can do, when you can do it. I am the one that will institute those reforms. Don't you ask for them. So the other thing he's instituted, though, is that it was illegal to have concerts, to have music in Saudi Arabia. And so he has opened that up. And that is an area where US companies have just poured in and say, we're going to build Disneyland, Six Flags. We're going to build Disneyland in Saudi Arabia. We're going to build these great um, uh, concert venues. And then there are US performers who are being asked to come and perform. And so we've had campaigns, like the campaigns around Don't Perform in Israel, uh, to say, don't perform in Saudi Arabia. And we were successful in a very famous uh, uh, artist who might not be the kind of music that this crowd listens to. Uh, and that is Nicki Minaj. Any of you know her? So if anybody you know, those of you who know Nicki Minaj, you wouldn't really think of her performing in Saudi Arabia. I mean, she is very revealing in her persona. The music and the words to her music are quite out there. Uh, and so we wondered, do they really know who Nicki Minaj is? <laughs> um, but there was a great campaign to get her to cancel her performance, um, which she did. And not only did she cancel it, because you know, sometimes it's art artists will cancel and just not say anything or said something else came up. She said, I wanted to uh, respect uh, free speech and the rights of my uh, fans in the gay community because she knows that being gay in Saudi Arabia can be a death sentence. So that was great. Um, we have, so we have lots of different campaigns around uh, boycotting Saudi Arabia. And again, if you sign up on that sign up sheet that's going around, um, we will give you the opportunity to join with us uh, in those campaigns. Um, so two other campaigns I wanted to talk about before I wrap up here. Um, one is something that is really following in the footsteps of the brilliant campaign done by the environmentalists uh, to divest from the fossil fuel industry. Uh, you probably have heard of that campaign, which targets uh, pension funds, individuals saying, pull your money from companies that uh, are invested in fossil fuels, going to cities, going to states, going to uh, churches, uh, and say, look at where your money is invested and make sure it's not invested in fossil fuels. Trillions of dollars, trillions, have been pulled away from the fossil fuel in industry. And that campaign is also a very, it's an educational campaign because it makes you have to think and convince other people why investing in fossil fuels is a bad thing. We also see it in the uh, private prison industry. There has been campaigns to say nobody should make a profit from putting people in prison. And that has been a very successful campaign. In fact, just two days ago, the California, uh, the state, decided to divest from private prisons. Wow. The state of California, that is fantastic. And so there have been a lot of victories, and we have started this campaign to divest from the weapons industry. And so we have a wonderful database that shows who are the companies invested in the weapons industry and shows you how you can challenge your city, your pension fund, your, uh, your uh, union, um, your city, whatever it is, um, to try to get them to divest. Church, like this church. So um, that is a great campaign. And the other one I wanted to talk about is the one about focusing on how we spend our money as a country, i.e. how our budget is distributed. You know, this is the time where we hear the 
candidates for a national office telling us all of the fabulous plans that they have for Medicare for all, for Green New Deal, for getting rid of college debt, really fabulous programs that our country so needs. Where is the program to say, not a vague, I think we spend too much on the Pentagon. That's easy kind of to say right now, and a lot of candidates are saying it. But where is the program that details that? Where is the program that says, how much are you going to cut from the Pentagon? And what programs are you going to cut? We have over 800 military bases overseas. How many of them are you going to close down? We have these wars going on. Which ones are you going to end? How much money will be saved from that? What weapon systems might not we need anymore? Like the Abrams tanks that we just keep churning out that the Pentagon says, stop, stop, we don't want them. We have way too many of them. We don't use them anymore. Or the F-35, the most outlandish, ridiculous uh, air system that has cost, will, will end up costing over a trillion dollars. So I don't know about you, but I want to hear from the candidates exactly what they are going to do. And so we have a campaign pushing the candidates to be specific, to outline how they are going to transform our country by taking a lot of money that's been invested in the military and move that over to these other life-affirming programs and the uh, campaigns we really need to invest in our planet before it burns up. And so I think it's really exciting to be a part of that movement to demand answers. And so I want to end um, with a couple of quotes that you might find interesting. And um, it really is to say that we have have to find ways uh, that we push the people in Washington and the ones who are supposed to represent us to really represent the values that we hold dear. I know you have a Center for Nonviolence here that does fabulous work to try to counter domestic violence and talk about violence that goes beyond domestic. And we know all of the ways that violence in the home is often connected to the violence overseas and how the uh, service people who we send overseas to fight these wars come back with terrible, terrible PTSD that often reverberates in our own communities. And so we are in desperate need of putting our efforts, our resources into finding nonviolent ways to deal with conflicts. And so one of the quotes I want to end with is dedicated to the gentlemen in the audience. And it comes from the great Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu. He said, it's only when you see a mosquito landing on your testicles that you realize there is always a way to solve problems without using violence. <laughs> and the other one might be a little more elegant. It's from Martin Luther King. <laughs> he said, don't let anybody make you think God chose America as his divine messianic force to be a sort of policeman of the whole world. We must rise up and beat our swords to plowshares. Nations must not rise up against other nations. I don't know about you, but I ain't gonna study war no more. Thank you very much.